from London, England, it's The Q, covering Discover 2016 London, brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Now, here's your host, Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. We're back at HP Discover 2016 on the banks of the Thames at the London docks, Excel London, where it is chilly. It's uh, below freezing here in, uh, in London, at least it was this morning. And uh, Paul and I are really pleased to have a segment now on uh, SGI, an acquisition that uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise made for I think around $250 million. Bill Manel is here, he's the Vice President and General Manager of the High Performance Computing Group at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and he's joined by Dr. Eng Lim Go, who's the Senior Vice President and CTO of SGI. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE, it's great yeah, to see you guys. Yeah, thank you, thank you for having us. So we're excited about this, it was kind of a, you know, $250 million, okay, that's not super small, but it's a sort of a tuck-in acquisition for HPE. Mm -hmm. What was the logic behind it? Well, so the logic behind it was to be able to take uh, a lot of the technology that SGI had in particular areas and be able to scale that, given the scale that Hewlett Packard Enterprise had. We felt that a lot of the technology, a lot of the capabilities were very complementary, so it made a really good fit in order for us to advance in both our high-performance computing and in our mission-critical areas. So Dr. Go, how would you describe sort of the, the architecture of, of, of SGI and sort of give us the background there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are two architectures. Uh, the first one is the HPC side uh, that uh, goes into uh, Bill Manel's organization. And that one is where we've built uh, highly scalable uh, supercomputers that uh, rank high in the top 500 of the supercomputers of the world. This is ICE? This is the ICE-X, well, okay. well done, yes. Um, and you have HPE being number one in the 100 to 500, and what we bring is that, uh, that high performance layer above the 100, right? And uh, this is where the ICE architecture plays well. You know, we deploy huge systems, and it will be leveraged well by, by Bill's organization. Now, the other uh, architecture, is a scale-up architecture uh, called UV mm -hmm. that will be incorporated into the mission-critical side uh, of HPE business. And one of the biggest uh, businesses there would be for SAP HANA. In the two years we've been uh, you know, selling this architecture for SAP HANA, uh, we've already done uh, 130 systems uh, and, and almost a petabyte of, uh, of in-memory HANA sizes yeah, in total. Okay, so these are obviously Intel-based systems. Yes, right? they are. Um, yeah. And did you sell Apollo into SAP HANA, or was there is there an overlap um, there? Or is uh, no, no. Apollo is more for HPC right. and probably more hyperscale from yeah. that standpoint. So there was really, there were really not a scale-up version of Apollo, right? No, so no, no. It's a scale scale out. Okay, so this server. fits nicely into That's that correct. that yes. portfolio. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then. Obviously, SGI, a very mature sort of code base and company, and, and so it, it positions you. Talk about that a little bit in terms of the, the Apollo overlap. Sure, um, so, so on the Apollo side, as Dr. Goh was saying, uh, we've really focused on a lot of the commercial space, mm -hmm. so in terms of financial services, manufacturing oil and gas, whereas SGI is focused a lot on the um, the public sector, research, and so forth and so on. So that has driven a difference in terms of portfolios that we see. Now there's a little bit of overlap from that standpoint, but in general, as we look at the portfolios, they're very complementary as well. And so we do expect, in some cases, we're going to migrate the technologies into a, to a single product line. In other cases, the product lines will continue to exist mm -hmm. as they are. Will your underlying architecture remain the same, or, or will it Well, certainly, be... certainly on the HPC side, we're, uh, we focus on, on water cooling architecture mm -hmm. at, the, at the top end because that's where customers are focused on the highest performance per rack. We only really do that with, with water cooling from that perspective. And then underneath it's going to be our air-cooled uh, portfolio as we go forward. So, so very similar to what HP offers today. But now yes. What industries are you, are you targeting right now? Has that changed? Um, I'd say that, uh, so as I mentioned previously, uh, HP has been very focused on the commercial side, especially financial services, manufacturing oil and gas. We've started to expand more, and part of the advantage of, of the, the, the SGI acquisition is that the public sector, they're very strong in, they're strong in life sciences, and so in a lot of areas that we want to get better in, they're very strong in. So again, even from the go-to-market standpoint, we have good, good mm. complementary type uh, Type uh, mm -hmm. of resources. 
And, and the market for HPC, the traditional market for HPC, if I understand it, I mean, I'm not an expert in this market, but I read HPC, what is it, HPC Wire? HPC Wire, yes. Great publication, yep. and, and, uh, and used to sort of follow that, that market, but it seems to be expanding mm -hmm. uh, as a result of, we, we joked about big data before in your title, but yep. um, it seems to be expanding into that yes. space. So we'll talk about the market. Dynamics. Um, yeah, so the market, actually the HPC market is one of the fastest growing markets from that perspective. So it's mm -hmm. growing probably in the high single digits yeah. uh, versus a lot of the other markets and servers are probably either just going a little bit or even being flat from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so, so a lot of that growth is around big data that you mentioned. So more and more customers, whether they're commercial or public sector, are needing the architectures in HPC to actually get value out of all that data. And Dr. Gove, Top Gun performance is sort of, there's bragging rights there, but it also has strategic implications. And of course now, China is bragging about some of its capabilities. It's becoming self-sufficient and going to have its own chip you know, by the end of the year, et cetera. So wh what's the importance and significance of that sort of top supercomputer performance? Hmm. Uh, both uh, business-wise as well as strategic and technology-wise. Business-wise, it is interesting that if you add up all the capability of the top 10 machine, that capability equals half of the remaining 490. <laughs> That's a very surprising statistic. Eh? Uh, so that alone tells you that being in that top 10 uh, gives you a position of strength. Yeah. Uh, now secondly, uh, strategically, because you push the envelope to be in the top 10 in order to get this system to stay up and run one application across the entire machine, right? It requires capability to achieve that. This is very different from a hyperscale data center of, say, a Google, where they will build a, a machine as big as a, the top 10 supercomputer, but that machine will support millions of users. However, the machine in the top 10 should, must be able to support only one user running one application across the entire machine reliably. That requires capability. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that, but that's a use case, it's a very limited use case. Yes, and yes. and uh, it Relative. seems like bragging rights aside, the application of your technology, I mean, were there markets that you simply were not able to, to approach uh, as an independent company because of lack of resources? Yeah, that's a, that's a very strong point. In fact, um, our biggest machine today is NASA's machine at number 13 on that list. We've been given opportunities to bid for the top 10, and there are times when it is because, one of the reason was because of the financial resources of our smaller company that we decided not to bid. It wasn't the only reason, but it certainly was one of the reason. And now with this acquisition being part of a bigger organization with stronger financial resources, uh, we should be thinking of starting to to go for that uh, top 10. Can you describe what's unique about your architecture in, in words that mere mortals can understand? Uh -huh. First and foremost, uh, you, know, you have to build a machine by assembling parts that are available from industry. That's, a, that's the first thing we do. The reason for this strategic decision is so that we can embrace a big swath of applications out there. It is using open standards to build a machine. Number two, we make sure that when we integrate it, we integrate the best of breed and integrate well. All right. And finally, when we do so, we do it highly energy efficient wise. The reason for this is that those biggest machines are now starting to consume of the order of 20, 30 megawatts of power. If you translate that to business, that's $30 million of electrical bill a year. Right. So if you, if, you, if you don't focus enough on energy efficiency and let that just run wild, you, you might just go to a 60 megawatts, right? And that will be $60 million of electrical Amazing. bill a year. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of effort put in to try and control and yet perform well, mm -hmm. control the energy consumption and yet perform well with uh, open standard components, right? So that's a very, uh, requires a capability to do that balance well. 25 years ago, there was this sort of explosion of supercomputer companies that hit the market. It was obviously Cray, and then it was, I think Son of Cray, and whatever instantiation came there, but Convex, and Kendall sure. Square Thinking Research, machines. and, yeah, and uh, Thinking Machines, right, Danny, what's his name? And, um, and there was such promise for that industry, it was getting a bunch of you know, investment from venture capital, and then you sort of didn't hear much, 
And now it seems like HPC is coming back. Um, it, first of all, is that true? Is that an accurate well, think, yeah. historical characterization? And will we see more companies entering this space? Yeah, well I think what's happening is that the, there was a period of time during which there was a lot of innovation. And so um, you innovated and then you could get performance and you found advantage of doing that. Then after a while, standard architectures, since it's the Intel architecture became mm -hmm. powerful enough to be, be able to do a lot of problems. Now, conversely, you're now seeing that that architecture starts to see limitations. So when you talk to a lot of big customers, they're saying, you know, we're really concerned because even though the chip itself is becoming more, more powerful, getting data in and out of it is now the problem. So bandwidth mm -hmm. becomes Bandwidth a, becomes the problem. I left, and I left IBM out of it, in fairness, right? And, and, and so now you're starting to see uh, a proliferation of new technology. So FPGAs are coming back, for yeah, example. Okay. I worked with them 10 years ago in HPC, mm. and now they're coming back. So okay. again, it's a response to the fact that uh, the standard architectures are starting to run out of gas. The problems continue to get bigger. I talk to customers all the time that are saying, you know, I've got a problem that, that uh, I can't solve with the current architecture. These are common names, they're not just, you know, uh, folks that you associate with like the top 10. These are common names of big industries and aircraft and automobiles and so forth that are saying, hey, the current architectures are running out of gas, we need to have a, have a new, new paradigm from that standpoint. It's, so you're it's, seeing that it, reinvent itself. And that's not new microprocessor, or is it? I mean, you uh, It's a combination, based, right? it's so new microprocessors, new, new buses, new technologies, uh, both from a uh, from memory perspective as well as a storage But you guys are Intel based across the, across the board, is that, is that correct? That's where or? we are currently, yes. Okay, but I mean, if, for instance, you've seen, you know, IBM always talks about power, and yes, its yes. bandwidth, and how Intel's running out of gas, Andy Bechtelstein said, don't worry, Moore's Law's not dead yesterday. Sure. It was an interesting debate, but, yep. but clearly from a bandwidth standpoint, you know, even Spark, which I don't think, I don't think uh, Oracle plays in the supercomputer space no, we don't uh, see at this point in time. That's correct. Uh, but those, those alternatives, there always seems to be room for you know, two, two chipsets right, sure, in the world. Sure. At least two, right? Yep, and I yep. see uh, others emerging. So, oh, absolutely. So you would expect that. So it feels like there's another renaissance coming yes, in, in, in HPC. Yes. Yes. Dr. Go, you, yes. uh, I'm sure you've been looking closely at the machine that yes. uh, HP, HPE was, was demonstrating this Very week. Very exciting. Uh, what is your impression of what is breakthrough about that technology? Where, how, and how will you be one of the first to apply it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we got really excited. We knew about it, of course, before the acquisition. Uh, but now that we are, have the inside of it, uh, we are even more excited. But the way I see it, there are three parts to the machine that is exciting. That uh, there are many parts that are exciting, but those three parts are the ones that uh, will be very keen to incorporate uh, into our architecture going forward. Number one is the concept of memory being a unified one, mm -hmm. where everybody else come to. Mm -hmm. right. uh, number two, uh, the, the, the enablement of that unified memory through Gen Z, which is an open consortium, brilliant, because we've always believed in the concept of mm -hmm. an open approach to building a supercomputer, mm -hmm. right? And then finally, the delivery of that openness through high bandwidth, low latency, uh, with uh, the silicon photonics. So those are the three parts. Mm -hmm. Unified memory, Gen Z to de deliver the unification, and silicon photonics to deliver the Gen Z. Yeah. And we are looking at uh, uh, taking pieces of it, implementing it in the scale-up architecture early, even before the V machine uh, so, materializes. So when HP talks about commercial availability of some components by 2018, that could precisely. show up in your system. Precisely. Yeah. It could show up in the HPE machine now, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and you didn't cite persistent memory. Is that because you I.O. bandwidth is not, not as much of an issue, or, or that's part of the number one? Yes, that's part of the yeah. number one. The concept of a unified memory, mm -hmm. and the fact that it's also persistent, gives it strong value, yes. So eliminating, essentially, I.O. That's right. <laughs> the need to make copies. Gene Emdahl, right, said yeah. the best I.O. is no I.O. <laughs> the the bigger, <laughs> biggest issue with I.O., right, if you take a step back, is that in the supercomputing side, the U.S. government is uh, uh, putting out uh, pr proposals to build supercomputers at the exascale level, which is a thousand times faster than the previous petascale level. But when they put that out, they don't just talk about exaflops of compute power, but they are also t talking about needing to handle the exabytes of data that results from it. So the issue with I.O. is if you have to make a copy, it is loss of I.O. It has to move somewhere else or for, for out and back to the same look. That's I.O., right? So the whole goal is to reduce copying. Persistent memory allows you to reduce copying. 
Yeah. Just quickly, the, the uh, uh, potential of, G of GPUs as, a, uh, uh, as an architectural component of, of supercomputers, uh, what are you doing in that area now, if anything? It is essential, right? Uh, if you are highly compute intensive focus, number one, or if you are highly machine learning, deep learning focus, the accelerators uh, in, in the form of GPUs are becoming the de facto way to achieve those numbers, right? So there are now, uh, in fact, uh, you're starting to see uh, the GPUs coming up with two versions, right? Um, the highly floating point intensive ones and the reduced uh, floating point precision ones for machine learning. And we, we need to build those, uh, uh, the ICE architecture to be able to accept blades with those GPUs in them. And we are getting inquiries from customers now who used to buy supercomputers of one kind to now thinking about, you know, I, I'm actually building a supercomputer for machine learning that could be quite different from a supercomputer that is uh, for highly compute intensive applications. Yeah, interestingly. How, how much of the business is, <clears throat> is government, you know, specifically U.S. government, I'm really interested in defense. Is it still sizable, is that right? Or, um, or in terms it, of the total market? Yeah, or? Uh, yeah in terms um, of the total market. Yeah, it's probably, <laughs> um, I would roughly say at least 10%, 15% is public sector from that standpoint. Yeah, so, okay, yeah. and a big chunk of that is defense. Yeah, that's correct. And, yeah, defense and, and intelligence. So, that's correct. Yeah, okay, and so a U.S. administration that is more likely to invest in defense is a good thing for the industry, yes. is that yeah. right? Yeah, and so the, and we probably already know this, uh, you know, roughly about a year, 18 months ago, the Obama administration issued an executive order around right. the National Strategic Computing Initiative. And that's the fact that they, they feel the need to drive yeah. supercomputing, not only for defense purposes, but also for economic well-being going forward. Yeah, and, and you know, for competitiveness globally, and it's yep. kind of a, you know, the, the, the moonshot example, right? mm -hmm. no pun intended. Yep. Uh, okay, last question. Uh, sure. Take us through the sort of timeline of the, the integration and what we should expect in terms of milestones over the next 12, 18 months. Um, sure, so, so basically we, we agreed, we agreed to come together uh, in August. We actually closed the agreement. So we went through uh, regulatory and so forth, worth uh, analyses and, and the permission, if you will. The shareholders of SGI voted to make it happen. That was on the 1st of November. So right. now we're, we're one company, if you will. Now the uh, employees of SGI become HPE employees in the US on January 1. So we call that employee day one. You know, so then at that point in time, you know, they show up on our system, they get HP benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Outside the U.S., you'll see that around the May time frame is what we're thinking. It takes longer mm -hmm. outside the U.S. So that's, that's in terms of where the employees are. From, from a roadmap perspective, we can actually have an NDA conversation with a customer today to talk mm -hmm. about roadmap. So we're actually pretty aligned as we came out of the November 1st close of the business. We had a lot of engineering teams working together flying back and forth between our various sites and getting that roadmap together. So we do have a consolidated roadmap that we can share with customers today. Um, and then over about a period of a year, we'll, we'll, we'll begin to start to integrate. So in the, in the short term, um, uh, Cassio Conceso, who's the, the COO of, of SGI, he's actually going to manage, if you will, the, the SGI business. And there's some, there's some discontinuities in terms of uh, fiscal years and things like mm -hmm. that that present some challenges from quota and sales reps and, and those sorts of things. So we'll be working through those, but but uh, the goal is about this time next year we'll we'll be uh, well on our way, if you will, to have a have a solid integration. And you'll keep the SGI brand, or that'll be folded. Uh, no, we're still discussing that mm -hmm. from that standpoint. Um, so so in general, probably in, in some of the lines going forward. Yeah. Yep. Good. All right, gentlemen, thanks very much for the update. Really appreciate you coming. All right, thank you. you. Very well, thank All you. All right, keep well. it right there, everybody. Paul and I will be back to London right after this short break. Right back.